The following program is a production of Pioneer Public Television. joint of this rabbit and if I've done the rabbit correctly he should come and just dislocate right out of the joint which he did. Funding for this program was provided by the Minnesota Environment and Natural Resources Trust Fund and by Safe Basements of Minnesota, your basement waterproofing and foundation repair specialist since 1990. Peace of mind is a safe basement. And by Live Wide Open, a regional movement that encourages people to make a great life for themselves in West Central Minnesota. And by Western Minnesota Prairie Waters, quietly beautiful and wildly connected. Once known as the sport of kings, falconry can trace its roots back 4,000 years from Eastern civilizations. The sport grew in popularity until the invention of gunpowder made using firearms a more efficient method for hunting. Today, there are approximately three to 5,000 falconers in the U.S. In Minnesota, there are less than 100 licensed falconers. One of those falconers keeping the sport going is Minnesota Falconers Association President Matt Lash. The Minnesota Falconers Association is a, a group of people that was formed in the early 70s, around 1973, 74, and they're just a group of people that promotes falconry and raptor conservation and conservation of the quarry that we chase. In February, we joined Matt and other falconers in Marshall, Minnesota for the association's annual meetup. Hoping that we can push them this way. Okay. I'll, I'll take point on that side now, Marshall. This weekend, we have falconers from all over the state. We have falconers from the southeast part of the state, uh, the metro area, the northwest part of the state. They're kind of from all over. And we actually have some folks that came over from Wisconsin to join us for this meet. Uh, and then also some spectators that came down from Canada uh, to help uh, beat the brush for us this weekend too. The draw for falconers and spectators is the birds of prey and the spectacle they put on. that we use are typically hawks and falcons. Um, we are allowed to use eagles, golden eagles, but you have a special permit for that. We typically do not use things like owls. Uh, the most typical one would be a red-tailed hawk, and you would ha hunt things like rabbits, squirrels, maybe the occasional pheasant or duck with them. Um, things like a goshawk, you'd hunt pheasants, ducks, um, maybe partridge, rabbits, squirrels. Uh, with falcons, we typically hunt avian quarry. So pheasants, ducks, partridge, maybe sharp-tailed grouse or prairie chickens if you get close enough. And then we also have micro birds um, that you can hunt things like starlings and sparrows and pigeons uh, with things like merlins and cooper's hawks. Those pine trees are the edge of what we can find. <coughs> so this, the first field we are going to um, is just a drainage ditch. We're going to be looking for rabbits with a goshawk. So he's going to be walking along with the goshawk on his fist and we're gonna form a line and push through there trying to get rabbits to move. Once we see one move, we're gonna use an old falconer term called ho, 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 you yell to get the falcons or the, the birds attention uh, and then they will chase the quarry after that. Got it! Got it, Charles! 
cocktail stuff. Yeah, yeah, that's right. The training really is just a, a food association, a positive reinforcement with food association with the birds and them to realize that you're not a predator for them. Because most of the birds we use are trapped from the wild as juvenile birds. We are not allowed to take adults from the wild. And so when you first trap them, you might sit down with them for the first evening or the first couple of days even and just sit with them and do nothing but sit with them on your fist and watch TV or whatever so they get used to you and understand that you're not going to hurt them or kill them, you're not a predator. And then it becomes positive reinforcement with food and so you might give them a small tidbit on your glove and the next day you might have them come a foot to it and then maybe three feet to it and then further. We are not training them to hunt at all. They know how to do that, they have that instinct. All we are doing is a lot, having them allow us to be part of that. Duration can, can vary depending on the species of bird and the individual bird. Um, it could take anywhere from maybe a couple of weeks to a couple of months. Uh, my particular bird that I have, she ate her, on her, her first meal right away, um, but I didn't free fly her for the first time probably until about a month out. Before you can trap and train a raptor, an individual must get certified with the DNR. You have to take a test and pass uh, the test with 80% or better. You have to um, pass your facility inspection and you have to get a sponsor that's going to help you along for the first two years. There are three classes of falconers. There's an apprentice class, which is the first two years when you have to have a sponsor helping you along. There's the general class, which is once you've upgraded from an uh, apprentice, you become a general. And then there's a the master class falconry. What it really means is the number of birds you can have and the types of birds you can have, what those classes mean, based on the experience that you have. Currently, I have what is called a passage or wild taken peregrine falcon. And I took, I've trapped her on the North Shore, just, uh, just north of Duluth. Minnesota is allowed one peregrine per year. Um, that is just from the federal guidelines, we're allowed one peregrine. And um, you have to be a master falconer to be able to take a peregrine. And I was lucky enough to have trapped one last fall. Matt's love of falconry started at a young age. I have always been fascinated by birds, especially raptors. And when I was 10 years old, I had found out what falconry was. And so I saw a gentleman on TV that happened to be have a, a peregrine falcon and he was raising um, baby peregrines to be released for the peregrine recovery. And I saw a phone number on the TV and decided to call it. And when I called it, he was a little surprised that a 10 year old kid had picked up the phone to call, but he had recommended me to go to the game fair, which is in Anoka every year and the MFA has a booth there. So I went there and I met people and got to hold a peregrine on my fist that day when I was 10 years old and have been hooked ever since. All righty, three, two, one, let's see some smiles. Gossack. Though small in numbers, falconers like Matt are committed to their sport. When they're not hunting with a hawk, many falconers are pursuing familiar outdoor pursuits. I also hunt uh, pheasants with gun, I hunt buck grouse, I'm a fisherman, I bow hunt deer, um, general outdoorsman, yep. and that's most of our club is that way too. They do all other forms of hunting also, this is just one aspect of, the, of their hunting. If you're a mature and experienced hunter and can tell the difference between a drake wood duck and a hen wood duck, take the drake. You know, that hen will come back next year and raise you 14 more. Whole rabbit, I lightly buttered it and seasoned it.
ducks are standouts among our myriad species of waterfowl. With the drake's blue-green crested head, distinctive stripes, and red eyes, and the hen's preference for laying her eggs in hollowed-out old trees. By the 1950s, old dead trees near lakes and potholes were disappearing. Without plentiful nesting habitat, many feared the wood duck would become extinct. That's when Roger Strand first started duck hunting with his dad and didn't want to see this colorful bird disappear. We're talking the early 50s. You could not shoot a wood duck legally. They were in trouble in this country, and so people started talking about nest boxes. The first nest boxes were attached to trees, but folks soon learned that squirrels and raccoons could reach in to grab dinner. So the placement and design gradually improved, including cutting an oblong hole just big enough for a hen to enter, exactly three inches by four. Roger joined the effort to save the wood duck and started erecting nest boxes on his farm near New London, Minnesota. I'm an old guy and I started putting wood duck boxes up on this property which eventually became my own in 1956, for God's sakes. About 40 years ago, after doing a lot of trial and error and have it finding dead hen wood ducks in boxes that were on trees and squirrel litters and so forth, I researched and tried different kinds of predator guards with my wood duck box. This is a cone predator guard, and it's three feet in diameter and steel, and I'm active with the Wood Duck Society and also with the Prairie Pothole Chapter of the Minnesota Waterfowl Association. And what we try to do, and we're doing our best, is to teach people that we don't put wood duck boxes on trees, for gosh sakes, because I tried, like everyone else, and squirrels will get in there. To help fund building more boxes, the Prairie Pothole Chapter started the annual Prairie Pothole Days fundraising event that draws 4,000 people for a day of shooting, climbing, archery, and other family activities. A Wilmer company has been making the boxes at cost for more than four decades, which the chapter now ships across the country. I have a hundred boxes that I monitor and I stopped at that point because you have to be able to really monitor them and keep track. I've been monitoring those now for, you know, 40, 50 years. Roger counts the number of eggs hatched in the afternoon because the hens lay in the morning. I'll crack open the door like this. I'll walk up to it, remember? No ladders in this hobby, please. No ladders, no trees. And so I walk up and I crack it open and she's giving me the evil eye right through there. She said, okay, you're back again. I know, just close it and let me be. Some of the boxes are fitted with high definition cameras that peek into wood duck hens' unusual behaviors. They may eat some of the eggshells after a hatch and more than one hen will lay eggs in a nest. Roger has counted as many as 36 eggs in a compound nest, 33 of those successfully hatched, a typical success rate in boxes he monitors. Chapter members also banned incubating birds, so they know the same hens return year after year. I tell my fellow duck hunters, if you have wood duck boxes in the area where you're hunting, what sense does it make if you're a mature and experienced hunter and can tell the difference between a drake wood duck and a hen wood duck? Take the drake. You know, that hen will come back next year and raise you 14 more. Roger, a retired surgeon, takes elementary and middle school kids out to check on nest boxes. A hands-on, teachable moment because the hens don't mind human touch. I, I can tell them take a look in there and they look in there and they can see those eggs and, and they start to reach for it and their teacher might say, oh, don't touch them. And I say, oh no, they can touch them. Just be careful. Remember, there's a live wood duck in there and, and you can see their eyes get to be about the size of silver dollars. And you can't do that with a pintail or a blue winged teal out in the prairie, but you can teach with this 
in a fantastic way. Local waterfowl chapters have remarkable success with modern nest boxes because they've been designed to evade predators. At SNS Birdhouses in Wells, Minnesota, owner Norbert Sonic has perfected an insulated PVC wood duck house that he says is predator proof. One of the first things we did to make it predator proof was to put it where the predators can't get at it and it made it uh, accessible for the the hen and the young ducklings to go into their uh, place where the predators can't get at them and once they jump out of the once they jump out of the nesting box why uh, they're only eight to ten feet or so away from the rushes where they go into their food supply and they're away from predators. We've mounted it on a three inch schedule 40 PVC pipe which makes it virtually impossible for a raccoon or a weasel or a mink to crawl up the thing. So the only problem we have predator that gives us a problem is the black bear and the human being. Them we can't do much about. Uh, over the last 11 years we've had about 85 percent success rate in them uh, because they're over the water and uh, we've made them virtually predator proof. The resin that the house is made from is impregnated with ultraviolet inhibitor and insulation. It keeps the eggs cool because if the if the egg itself gets over 112 degrees, it'll kill the embryo in the egg. That's one of the reasons why we insulated the wood duck house. The bottom of the house is deep enough so predators can't reach the eggs, and there's a little ladder for ducklings to grab with their feet and beaks to pull themselves out of the nest and into the pond below. SNS Birdhouses has manufactured wood duck boxes for 12 years and sells 1,500 to 2,000 annually not only in Minnesota, but as far as California, Texas, Massachusetts, and Alaska. These safe havens have helped restore the wood duck population. Biologists believe 100,000 breed in Minnesota each spring, so we can continue to enjoy these entertaining little water birds. One of the great things uh, about having wood ducks is when you see the little ones hatch and jump out of your wood duck box, that almost turns you into a pumpkin. <laughs> Watch out for the aqua invaders. These innocent looking plants and fish might be handsome and flashy, but they're choking habitats in the land of sky blue waters. Whether we invited them here or they hitchhiked in, we're out to identify these aquatic invasive species and stop their spread. This segment was brought to you by the Aquatic Invasive Species Task Forces of Candy, Ohio, Big Stone, and Yellow Medicine Counties. Today I have a special dinner I really want to show you. I have rabbit, roasted rabbit. We're going to pair this up with some fresh vegetables I'm going to show you how to do and carved potatoes. Now before you run away, you gotta watch how this is done. First of all, in the pan, you'll see that I've put a pat of butter down there and then something new that I got wind of, it's a camelina oil. Today, it's married with the butter. 
It has a very high flash point. It should help me keeping from smoking up too bad here and creating a problem. Whole rabbit, I lightly buttered it and seasoned it, roasted it in the oven. Takes you about 45 minutes to an hour. Now I want you to see, this, this is a telltale sign right here because I did French the bones a little bit from the legs. And Frenching the bones is nothing more than taking the backside of a knife generally and just scratching it when it's in the raw stage. Now you always want to be a little bit careful in transferring over because obviously you, you see the juice I got here. If I got too much moisture jumping over to the hot oil, bam, 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 and it's right back in my face or worse yet, on my hand. Now here's the other front joint of this rabbit and I'm going to open that up and if I've done the rabbit correctly, he should come and just dislocate right out of the joint, which he did. Now, once this has been browned on both sides, I'm going to transfer this into an oven pan and we're going to put that in the oven at 350 degrees. Now the only reason for that is because we're going to try to finish off the uh, honey and mustard glazing on the top. Now if you take a look at this cup, I just want you to kind of see that I, I've done equal measurements of honey, mustard, and then I put a pinch of mayo on the top. Mayo is a mother sauce, but in this case, it'll help me stick onto that product. I'm gonna whip this up for us today, and all I wanna do is I just want this nice, sweet mustard glazing. That's all I want. Now, listen to your crackling. When you hear that popping happen a little more often, that's the fat or whatever fat was there is telling you, pop, 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 I'm, I'm about ready to turn, okay? And then I also watch the top of the meat as it's cooking through, it's gonna weep that moisture, try to push that moisture up because that muscle is tensing up. Now, the other thing I want you to notice is here browning here slightly, that's from that butter, because this baby is wide open here, so I'm frying on high. So I'm hitting it really fast, really hard. You wouldn't necessarily have to do it that way at home. You maybe got a little more time. But here, the camera crew is hungry, so we got to go a little bit faster. This is where I'm going to add just a little of this to the top of the meat right away. Now, what we can expect to have happen here as you see all these little bubbles, the smaller they get, the more moisture that is cooking out of here. And I'm getting more and more sugar. As a matter of fact, since I poured that in, the aroma, the scent that's gonna come from this, it's getting even stronger, even more perfumed. And you smell it, oh, look at here now. See how it's starting to golden a bit? That's that honey, everything's caramelizing. Those sugars are breaking down. So that's when it's trying to tell me, Kurt, get on the stick here and move this to the other pan. Now look here, see how that's getting syrupy? See that? Now, that's what I was hoping to have happen because I want that to, uh, I'm gonna slide this in the oven, but I want that there. And I want that to caramelize. Now, I just chopped up fresh vegetables here. You wouldn't have to do that. You could use frozen vegetables. For me, th these are my favorite. I got a dog that eats these right out of the garden. He'll pick them himself. I got carrots. And now you're going to say, Kurt, you didn't pre-blanch those carrots. And you're right, I didn't. But I sliced them pretty thin. They're going to cook through rather rapidly. The other item I wish to add in here, I'm going to introduce you to a carved mushroom potato. Now I made plenty of these to share. And then I'm going to show you how we carved this. So we're just gonna tack them in along the side here because I roasted these with the rabbit while it was cooking in the oven. I took the time to carve them, added it to it. You can see I'd also added some water to that rabbit. I leave all that there. That all stays right there, stays the same. Now, let's go back to here. And what we're looking is, we're gonna see how much of this sauce is left. Now you see that you see that the veg here has sucked a lot of it up. Well, this is the flavoring tool. We can add a little bit more, but I was, if I don't add it here, I'm gonna add it to the rabbit, okay? And instead of getting this too sweet, I'd prefer adding some of the broth from the actual rabbit. 
So, the veggies that we're using here, celery, onions, and carrots. Remember that fancy word, mirepoix? That's what's in there. And this stock will just be added to that. This all tastes like the rabbit and the seasoning you added. So now you've just flavored this veg as well. Now note the amount of liquid here. You saw me pour just a little bit of that broth in there, but that's all I need. You, you want like that, you don't want much. Can you see there on the bottom? Very little liquid left, okay? Just enough that'll help you coat. I'm using a wide rimmed glass bowl that has a very deep, deep center point. So I got legs and I got front joints. I'm gonna mix them on each side. And I always put the big ones right where I'm sitting at the table, right? Is that the truth? Okay, then just a hint more of this glaze. And that way I can make it look as wet and moist as possible, okay? At that point, I'm ready to serve. Here's what you end up with. Frozen veg will work as well. Chicken would do the same thing here. If you don't have rabbit, want to use chicken. Uh, well worth the try, well worth the effort. All right? Thank you for watching. Give this a try. Funding for this program was provided by the Minnesota Environment and Natural Resources Trust Fund and by Safe Basements of Minnesota, your basement waterproofing and foundation repair specialist since 1990. Peace of mind is a safe basement. And by Live Wide Open, a regional movement that encourages people to make a great life for themselves in West Central Minnesota. And by Western Minnesota Prairie Waters, quietly beautiful and wildly connected.